Right, so good afternoon to those who are here. Uh, 1.6 in your textbook. I have the book open here. Um, this is about page 18. And uh, I think when we were signing off last week, I was trying to tell you all that it's such a good read. Um, it's, um, it, is, it is a good read of, you know, um, when you look at the book, then the book is sort of populated with charts and titties and, you know, keys and think tanks and stuff. So it's not, it's not quite like a novel then. If you turn that page to page 20, there's a huge pity there, right? So um, by the time you start reading, right? And then if you look at page 20, uh, the, the top of it is not even completed. The, the right-hand side of the page um, has like just about what, five lines. So when you start reading, you realize the book is not a difficult read, right? But of course, you know, we do the explanation and uh, hopefully that should assist a bit more where the reading is concerned. So. 1.6, the heading is competence. Uh, because we are starting, I would kind of read from this slide and then we will try to break it down a bit. Um, and then we'll end off possibly with a question, right? So competence, the compliance audit must be conducted by at least one person knowledgeable in the process and a report of the findings of the audit must be developed and documented. Noted deficiencies that have been corrected the two most recent compliance audits or reports must be kept on file. So I think this is something from picking up from last week, but the idea is that um, uh, compliance and probably even competence is something that can be audited, right? And so I think by now we know that like um, during an audit, there's normally an element called training. And that is what 1.6 is about. You just have to kind of look into um, page 19 and you'll see it have to do with training as well. So during an audit then, right, the auditors would normally ask for, you know, like your training records, right? Like what did the employee do? And those of us, if you have your books, page 19, before I reach mine, because I have mine too, but you know, we actually not on that slide as yet. You'll see on page 19, you'll see like that training needs analysis. Um, and, uh, well, I guess those of us in normal safety, this would be more for, you know, like what courses you can do, like defensive driving, um, risk assessment, plea. But for process safety, it's a bit more unique to process then, right? So you may have to do like an instrumentation course. Um, it may be that there is a refresher on permit to work, the things that pertain to, to process safety then, right? So like we have done, um, we have done hazards for diesel cut. I think some of you all know what a hazard is here, but those who don't know will come to it in a bit. And if you don't know, remember we mentioned it on the first class, a hazard is like one example of an advanced RE. It's not the best one, but it's a popular one because it's easy to do, right? So um, based on the person's position, you see uh, on page 19, you'll see things like quality technician, process engineer. They would have certain courses allotted to them then, right? Like basic induction, permit to work, lockout tagout, right? And so the idea is that this is a training needs analysis, but it's a training needs analysis of process safety. And that's it. That's actually all 1.6 is all about. Everything I do again is just reading and, and seeing the same thing over and over, right? 1.6, exactly what that is all about, right? It is a training needs analysis, but catered for the rules and function of those who are in process safety. So um, I wouldn't read all of this. Um, I'll just read some of this. Competence is a combination of practical and thinking skills, experience, and knowledge. I think that's the best way to put it. No, this is not an exam question. It's just what competence is, right? So competence, for somebody to be seen to be competent, they must have um, a certificate, right? Uh, like certifiable knowledge then. Um, and then the other thing that makes you competent is that you have the know-how. So experience is one thing, right? So somebody could have a certificate. I'm sure you all have come across people like this in your life. Somebody have a certificate, a plumber, or whatever have you, right? And um, they, like they say they have five years experience, so they say they have 10 years experience, but they can't get the job done, right? And so in your mind, like if you know people like that, the certificate doesn't make you competent, right? So the same thing, a NIBO certificate doesn't make you competent. It verifies your knowledge, but it doesn't make you competent, right? Competence is a combination of all, right? Com like competence is that, you know, like you know what you're doing, you have the experience, but then you have the certificate as well. And for the young persons here, 
you know, uh, best of knowledge you can get with, with, with studies as well as with experience and practice as well, right? Hence, we see students, you know, um, you know, taking part in shutdowns and, of course, you know, being employed in the safety field and stuff as well, right? So, competence, just remember that. I don't know if you want to take a note because remember, it is multiple choice. Um, thinking that it is multiple choice, I was just thinking there, what if we ask you, what's the most important one? Like, um, that's a really tricky question though. Like, uh, but that, then again, that's multiple choice, right? What do you think could be the most, out of the three of them that you see in there, right? Um, so competence is a combination, but let's break, up the com let's break up the combination. So if it's practical, thinking skills, experience and knowledge. So that's about four, come to think of it, right? So practical, thinking skills, experience and knowledge. If they ask you what is the most important, because then that's what multiple choice goes. Now, by the way, this is not a question. Yeah? I'm just saying, I mean, it's not a past paper. It does not mean it would not come. It doesn't mean that it, that it isn't a question, right? What do you think? Think of someone who has a certificate, 10 years experience. They could think, so thinking skills is that they could think about something. They could think about, you know, solutions, practical. If they ask you what is the most important attribute of, com of competence and like, like which person would you trust to do a job, you know, um, if they have not all, but they have one of those attributes there. Anybody can give a guess? I just check in your, um, your, speaking of thinking skills, I just check in your thinking skills. And you can probably X of the one that is wrong because I think we, we said knowledge is wrong. Like, a certificate is wrong because somebody can have a certificate, but they don't know what they're doing. So that may be a hint. I probably sell it out there if, if you could figure that out, right? And if you just check the real world too, sometimes you have people that do things for you. Thanks, Darren, for the answer. Anybody else? Um, like you can have people that do things, you know, like uh, like I said, um, plumbing and whatever, electrical. But um, in other words, and would the light work or would the type and fix their work. If you had four persons to choose from, right? One of them have the practical, the other one have the thinking skills, the other one have the experience. 10 years, right? They, they say they have 10 years, right? And, and uh, the other one have a certificate in plumbing. But, but which one, right? I mean, if you had to pick, which one is the most valuable skill? Right. Experience, 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 experience. Anybody else? So one more, I try to tip it, I try to tip it into a particular direction. So you take a note of this, right? You take a note of what I'm telling you here. And um, you know, you'll, you'll think about what I'm telling you here, right? So the answer is actually, if it was a question that the person know what they're doing and that is actually practical, right? Later on in the day, you'll kind of try to digest what I just told you there, right? So someone, and I'm, this is, you know, I've seen people have certificates and they can't do anything. But if they know what they're doing, so they, like I said, they could say they have 10 years experience, but they still don't know what they're doing, right? Some people try to live off that. They try to live off the fact that, you know, we have five years experience, 10 years experience, you know, but they, they still don't know what they're doing. They, they, they set up the pipe and the pipe would leak, right? So the best answer there for those of us, and I think it could be a question because I remember something like it, not quite like how I said it, but the fact that you know what you're doing and the thing will function then, right? So it's the practical skill, right? Now, please remember that was just a made up question. The ideal thing is that the person must have all. So then you can judge competence, right? Competence is a combination. I was just trying to be a bit difficult there. Right, combination is, uh, sorry, competence is a combination of all of those anyway. All right, I'm moving on. Um, because I said, uh, other than that, I don't think there is a question there, right? So in um, process safety, if you want, I can just tell you, and uh, so you can look at your book. In process safety, they have a particular um, phrase they use. Um, and in, in normal safety, we have a phrase that we use too. So I've actually seen both for exams. I've seen both phrases then, right? So I, I don't know if they write the other one or just say it. I think I'll write it because it came for an exam once, right? So um, the, the most common phrase you see is a TNA, right? So you can see this for example, a TNA, 
training needs analysis. Uh, some persons may say like a training gap analysis. So this is like a common phrase you'll see like in everyday safety for the year, you know, they will judge somebody's. And again, you as a safety, right? This is something that safety can do too. If you get into a company, you can actually assess the person's qualification and then try to figure out what should they do for this year, right? Do we need to do first aid training? Could we do risk assessments? I'm doing risk assessments again for some companies at the moment too. A um, couple of weeks ago, I did defensive driving. So, you know, I mean, companies have a training register there and a training gap and, and they try to bridge those gaps, right? So anybody getting into safety here, that's a nice way to start to try to get, you know, the team on board or trying to get a team in the first place is by you know looking at what they have and what they need to do. But in process safety, do right what they do, they call it PSCMS. So process safety competence, you'll probably see it on the other slide. Process safety competence management scheme. So look out for these kind of words. They have used both so you know anyone can come. And I think there's a question here. So we look at it in a bit. Um, they can just say what is the means of analyzing, you know, worker skill and planning for a new job. They can, in the answer, can have TNE, training needs analysis, but they could also have PSCMS, Process Safety Competence Management Scheme. And like I said, when I turn this slide, you'll see some of that, right? So it includes skills and knowledge on human factors, issues such as, for instance, avoiding conflict and goals, handling of unseen uh, events, situational awareness, avoiding fatigue. So anything can work. I mean, those of us who know anything that pertains to your company could work. The man machine interface, which is actually ergonomics. That's a nice one. We do all of those things anyway. It doesn't really have a big market in Trinidad for those things, but you know, the market is bigger uh, in the UK, right? Um, so I'm just trying to bring this one down. Um, so why is process safety competence important? I think we came across these past incidences. We need to learn from that. Um, Many incidents happen because necessary knowledge or competence is not available at the right time in the right place. And that is just how it is, right? Uh, that is just how it is. Um, you know, uh, a lot of the disasters then, right? The one with Chernobyl, uh, we sort of touched it last week a bit. It was because of, um, it was the Christmas holidays then, right? So all the senior workers had left and they left the junior workers. It is always an excuse. There's always some sort of thing why things happen, right? Um, sometimes, you know, managers, uh, a manager would leave because um, they have an exam, right? So, so all of these are past cases that there's always when you look at the root cause, like the senior competent person would have left then, right? So there's always a root cause why a lot of these things happen, right? So the rule of competence in safe working and behavior, it allows a better hazard determination and risk estimation some process hazard analysis using suitable techniques such as a hazard. So we may get to, to that today. Um, so uh, for now, I guess you could just write it down that a hazard is a team approach. So if the team gets together, and they try to estimate what could happen. It could actually build their competence. And by the way, hazard should be part of everybody's uh, safety training. I did, um, well, I didn't really get time any week, but I did challenge some students that if you see any um, process ads, just look through it a bit, put it in the group chat. And most likely you'll see things like hazards is what they are asking for, right? Um, so the rule of competence, positive attitude towards process safety can result in reduced errors and violations. So the rest of it, we kind of know that better perception once somebody is more competent, right? Um, so the rule of competence management training, the need for appropriate managerial training is a legal requirement under the UK laws. And as I mentioned, if you look at the book, you know, everybody should go through training, right? Not just the workers. In the process safety field, seeing that we did cover uh, leadership uh, in 1.2, we must start then with the manager, right? So technicians, experts, supervisors, managers, CEO, everybody should be given a bit of training anyway. And I did mention, they refer to it as uh, the PSCMS, the Process Safety Management Scheme. So just a bigger way of saying TNA, Training Needs Analysis. Right, um, so a process safety competence management scheme details the process used to ensure that the necessary standard, standards of process safety competence are maintained within the company. It can include the following elements coming up with a high level policy statement. We're gonna to touch that just now again. Um, facilities minimum 
process safety competence requirements. So that's actually very important, right? Facility minimum talks about like minimum then, I don't know if you're getting this, like it must have a senior manager on site at all times. So it isn't a skeleton staff, the facility minimum, like what happened in Chernobyl and stuff, right? It shouldn't be that the facility minimum are all junior technicians. So in the a lot of rules and responsibility, a senior manager should always be on site on paper. Of course, like I said, stuff happened. When you read some of these case studies and the root cause of them, the senior managers may have left early to attend a family function or even, you know, things like funerals and stuff. And then these are the, the things that, that, you know, leave junior persons in charge anyway. Um, selection and recruitment of personnel. Again, that's part of the, the human resources. So the, the, the know that they're getting, you know, persons that are qualified. Individual competence need analysis and managerial or managing the competence gap. So that is what we're looking at there if you have the book on uh, page 20, right? So maintaining competence, training and development. And the way to do it is with the headed, which is the PSCMS, right? So I do have a couple of them here. Um, so if you read through, you see the same thing, you identify the key rules, you identify, you know, uh, what they have to do and what training that have to be done anyway, right? So, I mean, they're not asking any notes, it's just a bigger understanding, right? So let's try to get to one of the charts anyway, right? So again, this is a physical way of getting it. This one, I would have stepped it up then, you know, like, the, like define what everybody have to do and like what they have to do based on their rules. And then you sort of allot the training to them. So if you don't know anything about doing this in real life, you can just take it from here, step-by-step step and write a procedure for it anyway. So this is literally like a procedure for develop an PSCMS. So I have one here. So competent or competence areas with their different levels can be linked with their rules. This can be done example as a matrix, right? So we have the process engineer, um, process supervisor, process operator, plant manager, process safety specialist. And we have like a rating, um, you know, like what level of competence the person requires, I, I would suppose here three is the highest, right? One is the lowest. So process operator one, the specialist would be, you know, like a level three, right? Um, plant manager, not everything they would need to be a specialist in because they are just the manager, right? So re, uh, chemical reactions, they need to know about, you know, endothermic, exothermic reactions, hazardous substances, competence level two. So this is just an idea of what the um, the level of details that can go into a management scheme. I think the book really did say it easier than how I said it anyway, right? Um, again, competence training can be forecasted and planned using a training needs analysis or TNA, TNA template. Let's give me a minute to admit some people, right? Um, indicated mandatory and recommended training. So again, this is just literally sort of made up. You will have to do yours for your company. Um, so we have the level four course, right? Uh, the different persons that may be in a plant. And again, this may not be you. Uh, you might not use the same headings. You can probably just say HSC, you know, officer, technician, which I have here, uh, supervisor. But the thing is, this should be done. This is like a proactive thing to be done. And um, those of us in the companies that, you know, that have a good culture, this is something that is done on a monthly basis. So make clear that up. When I say monthly basis, the TNA may be done for a quarter, right? But then on a monthly basis, they scorecard the training that they get done, right? So there are companies like Massey and Atlantic and literally anybody as an industrial estate, right? That they place a good portion of the, the days then, right? Or the hours then on training, right? Uh, some companies, they have like a high target to meet so training must be done and then you have to answer for that. And the way we get it done is by, you know, like the Monday morning meetings, uh, putting employees on specific training. So, and then at the end of that month, we scorecard that on your TNA. And then that can be fed back into, I guess, um, uh, like a conformance, non-conformance chart anyway, right? So I, I just sort of made this one up, but it's a good idea for those of us who are in the safety field. Um, it might not be process safety, but you may want to learn something else then. Like if you already know, I guess, a normal risk assessment, you may want to know about like what are the hazards on your plan there, right? So it may be 
risk assessment techniques for your, you know, for your company. Of course, we're going to stick to process safety. So the operational manager has basic knowledge and process safety. That's called fundamental is basic, right? So that's mandatory. Um, you know, like emergency uh, um, health, you know, um, you know, persons that deal with emergencies and safety specialists, mandatory, mandatory, mandatory. Um, the R stands are recommended, right? And so root cause analysis might be recommended for an operational manager, project and engineer may be recommended, right? And so this is just kind of populated just to show you that the chart could look, you know, anywhere and everywhere, but the point is it is really to have it, right? And um, of course, like I said, this is more process as compared to everyday safety anyway, right? And that's about it. I have a question here, a couple of questions here. Um, we remember the questions are all from past papers. Well, I say all, but there's just one here, I guess. We, we sort of did this one already. But we'll come and look at it again. No, actually, we didn't do it, right? It looks familiar, but um, that's because I use the same graphic, right? Let's have a look at this and um, see if we can figure this one out. This is a past paper. Again, whenever you see them, please print your slides. We have come across a lot already. Uh, print the slides and um, have a go at it, right? So um save them then we'll probably write them over on a piece of paper or something if it's not too much copy and paste it in another word document right so you have some questions there anyway um have a look at this i want to read the top of it and i'll leave you for the answer uh the one thing we said about process safety though is that um you know despite it being deeper like what we just did there right like we'd have never heard about pse ms before it have just done tna but um, you know, uh, at the end of the day, the work is like a bit deeper than level three. But the great news is that it is a multiple choice exam, right? So workers competently perform routine tasks on a process line. A new process will shortly be introduced and require many different skill sets. What is the best way to help with planning to fill this skills gap? And it can really only be one answer because we have not mentioned any of the other words. Right, a psychometric test and is a good test by the way, but you know, um, you can just lie on a psychometric test. You know, I mean, everybody have, right? If you know what a psychometric test is, right? They ask you like, do you work well in groups? You say yes, you know, it's not as if you have to, no one really, you know, it's just things you do, right? So yes, the answer is a resounding B, training needs analysis, but folks, this is one question look out for if they mention something with a competent skill gap or something along an acronym there, the PSEMS, right? Um, in different past papers anyway, right? Um, let's have a look at the other one. So we, I think there was a couple of words there, training development programs applicable to process safety could include standard training, non-standard training and emergencies, right? So you sort of could plan like what is gonna to happen to your company Right. Again, there's so much more to it. Like it, it can just be like how to start up your machines, how to shut down your machines. So that's just standard. But the start up a reaction, right? Non-standard reactions. Non-standard doesn't have to be an emergency. It doesn't have to be. A non-standard is just that you're doing something that you're not accustomed to doing then. Probably based on a client request or something. But it's not an emergency. But you have a procedure for it. Otherwise, would you just be doing your own thing? If a client asks you, you must have a procedure to meet the client's expectation based on what the client is asking. And different clients may ask a different testing to be done then. So non-standard doesn't always mean emergency, right? Um, anyway, the class activity was a bit of the passive. So this one is highlighted for you. So there's no need to, let me just read this one, right? So I think this is what I was trying to remember when I was talking about competence, right? Which of the following is considered evidence of competence? So let's have a read of them still, right? Which of the following is considered evidence of competence? So this is like that thing there. This is like this, the certificate, the thinking, the saying you have 10 years experience, right? So like which, which one, right? So A, trainer, supervisor, watching the way a worker performs a task and signing off to confirm it is correct. So see if we can figure why that is wrong. Training supervisor, like why is A wrong? Watching the way a worker performs a task and signing off to confirm it is correct. Why is that wrong?
process so because it it encompasses part of the process to deem somebody competent but it is not all or is not the main thing right okay anybody else and for those of us who like it finished you get us turn your page in your book you, you realize that chapter one is actually finished right um so that's how easy that was chapter four is like that but chapter two is a bit longer right um uh, anybody else think you know like why is a not the answer because a is not the answer right uh b i'll keep reading sign off form to confirm that a procedure was read and understood so a sign of form could never show competence because remember people sign things off all during the day like what they did in um, you know certain companies looking at the sign of form and saying that you that you did do a pre-startup safety review um and for those who don't know what that is it's just like a check right so it, it, like looking at the inspection form then and saying that you did do the inspection that doesn't mean that you're competent because anybody could just sign that right attendance at a toolbox talk that could never be competence because again there are some companies where people just put their name right the form goes around or better yet for those of us who know some people will go to a toolbox talk they would sleep right and then you know when time when the meeting is finished somebody will wake them up and then you know they just sign the form so that's not competence but but d which is what i said practical right an operator undertaking a work related task without causing harm to themselves or others and probably getting the task done the proper way that is really competence right like i was saying think about i don't know what you all do think about something that that and i fed up use my same example sometimes from class to class but um yeah so kavita i think this is perfect right that um the, the point about a is that the person is still being watched right the person still have to be supervised then so then doesn't really competence right i was telling um a story where i had a plumber do some work here for me and the guy i mean he had a lot of certificates he was well spoken um he actually you know was in a company and he did that on the side and everything was everything looked good but you know um, at the end of the day things like pipe fittings and stuff like he had to study how to put that up right and uh, so he was trying to kind of tread um a pipe you know those faucets those hot and cold faucets which is what i have right like you know those um see he was trying to tread a fish right a hose into that right but he hooked up the faucet part first and then he was trying to to sort of fish the, the, the hose from underneath literally hours man hours right hours into like from daylight into the night until i came and asked him what he was doing right and uh you know you know i, I just said so why you just didn't take out the faucet and just tread it up first right and just when you mount it up just put it you know like the hose money in it if you know what i'm talking about so you know competence is one thing and, and certificate and stuff is another thing knowing how to do something is one thing and then you know uh having a certificate in it or something as anyway right folks i think that's it i really wanted to show a video now because we haven't shown any as yet and uh, but i don't know how it will work right because zoom does give a lot of trouble when you say you want to do these things right so what i'll do i'm going to take off my camera a bit um if i get it to run you just wouldn't hear me right i just will stay silent if i get it to run and once it run it will let it run through the whole class anyway it's not very um it's not very long can you tell me if you are seeing um like a video in the background it should be saying a uh, safety and hazard investigation board u.s chemical safety hazard investigation board are you all seeing that yes sir yes, okay. yes sir. all right so i guess let me let it run if it running and you're not hearing the volume you can let me know but if you're hearing the volume just don't say anything right you just let it run at 7 15 p.m on february 7th 2008 
a series of violent sugar dust explosions devastated the Imperial Sugar Refinery in Port Wentworth, Georgia, just outside Savannah. Explosions raced through the buildings, fueled by accumulations of combustible sugar dust and sugar that had spilled from equipment. Thick concrete floors heaved up and brick walls were blown into stairwells and work areas, blocking many exit routes. Fires spread rapidly. Eight workers died at the scene. Six more died later at a regional burn center. Dozens of others were injured. The plant's massive sugar packing buildings were a total loss. The accident at Imperial Sugar was the deadliest industrial dust explosion in the United States in decades. It highlights the extremely serious nature of combustible dust hazards. There were significant accumulations of sugar dust and spilled granulated sugar on surfaces throughout this facility. Conditions were set for a catastrophic accident. Imperial Sugar's sprawling Port Wentworth complex began operations in 1917 and grew to become one of the largest sugar refining and packaging facilities in the U.S. Granulated sugar from the refinery was stored in three 100-foot tall silos and then conveyed into packing buildings where it was packaged for distribution. Granulated sugar was also converted into specialty products such as brown sugar and powdered sugar. Sugar was transported by a complex system of bucket elevators screw conveyors, and conveyor belts. During this process, sugar spilled onto floors throughout the work area. In places, the spilled sugar was many inches deep. This sugar also contained fine particles, which became airborne. In addition, hammer mills were used to crush the granulated sugar into powdered sugar, creating even more dust. The machines were connected to a dust collection system, but it was undersized and in disrepair. And it was not connected to the bucket elevators and conveyors. Significant amounts of sugar dust escaped into the work areas. Workers routinely used compressed air to clean packaging machines, further dispersing sugar dust throughout the buildings. Over time, large amounts of dust accumulated on elevated, hard to clean surfaces, such as dust, beams, and light fixtures. These surfaces were not cleaned often enough to always keep the dust below hazardous levels. In the tunnel beneath the sugar silos, granulated sugar flowed through chutes onto a long steel conveyor belt. From time to time, clumps of sugar would become stuck in one of the chutes, blocking of sugar on the top, spilling sugar onto the floor and releasing dust into the tunnel. But the tunnel was large and ventilated, so this airborne dust did not build up to explosive concentrations. However, in 2007, the company enclosed the conveyor belt with stainless steel panels to protect the sugar from possible contamination. The enclosure was not equipped with a dust collection system. As a consequence, Sugar dust would now be trapped inside this enclosure. On February 7, 2008, clumps of sugar were found blocking one of the discharge chutes. Sugar from the adjacent silo likely spilled off the moving belt. Dust likely accumulated to an explosive concentration inside the enclosure. At about 7.15 p.m., the sugar dust contacted a nearby ignition source likely an overheated bearing, and exploded. This primary explosion blew apart the enclosure. Accumulated sugar was lofted and ignited by the advancing fireballs. The dust clouds fueled a chain reaction of secondary explosions, which swept through the building. Concrete floors buckled, releasing tons of granulated and powdered sugar the evacuation drills had not been conducted, and the explosions had cut the power to much of the interior lighting. 
In the seas of darkened and damaged stairwells and passageways, workers desperately tried to flee the building inferno. The CSB found that correspondence dating back to the late 1950s showed that plant managers in Port Wentworth were aware of the explosive nature of sugar dust and the danger of dust accumulation. As far back as 1961, a memo described a sugar dust explosion that heavily damaged the powdered sugar mill room. Despite the long-standing awareness of the explosive nature of sugar dust, not enough was done to manage the hazard. In 2006, the CSB issued a study of combustible dust, which called on OSHA to establish a comprehensive combustible dust standard based on the current standards of the National Fire Protection Association, or NFPA. In October 2007, OSHA began implementing a new national emphasis program to increase the enforcement of existing regulations related to combustible dust. Imperial Sugar learned of the OSHA Combustible Dust National Emphasis Program four months before the devastating explosion at Port Wentworth. But management did not act effectively to control the serious dust problem in the packing buildings. Less than two months before the disaster, an internal inspection showed that many tons of sugar were still regularly spilling onto the floors. This provided much of the fuel for the massive secondary explosions and fires. The CSB found that over the years, the Port Wentworth facility periodically experienced small fires fueled by spilled sugar and accumulated dust on equipment, but none resulted in a sugar dust explosion that propagated through the plant. Investigators said that decades of operating without a catastrophic explosion may have lulled managers into complacency. In its report, the CSB issued the following recommendations to the Imperial Sugar Company. Apply NFPA standards to the design and operation of the rebuilt Port Wentworth facility. Develop and implement comprehensive combustible dust control, housekeeping, and training program. Improve emergency evacuation policies and procedures. Companies can go a long way to control combustible dust within their own facilities by following the existing recommendations of the National Fire Protection Association. But it is also time for a comprehensive federal standard on combustible dust. In April 2009, OSHA announced plans to begin rulemaking on a combustible dust standard for general industry. In its final report on the Imperial Sugar Accident, the CSB recommended that OSHA move forward expeditiously with the new standard. Without regulation, enforcement, and education, workers will continue to be at risk from catastrophic dust explosions. For further information, please visit csb.gov. Right. I'm just trying to get back some um, functionality here with Zoom, right? Um, you know, the, the, it runs a bit slower. Can you hear me still on your side? And uh, like, like, what did you all think? I think, um, so I think I have to stop this share, right? Uh, because um, to get back to the PowerPoint, right? Um, so I guess the idea you all saw there was that, um, you know, that is what process is is kind of all about. Um, so that preventing those catastrophes is not just like a normal accident. Um, the dust explosion there would have been like a massive dust explosion then, right? And, uh, um, you know, I think that's the idea that we want to protect life, but we also want to protect the plug at the same time, right? Let's all get back to the PowerPoint. But in fact, come to think of it, we are changing PowerPoint. So I do believe um, in the week, 
just can't remember what day it was. I don't know if you all could confirm. Um, you know, I do mark it on my register. So let me just check and see. I did give you all another PowerPoint. How it was on the 4th of July. Okay, so not to show what day that was. That, that, that doesn't really help me, but yes, it is. I've seen here the fourth as well. Um, not even sure what day that was, right? Um, yeah, I do work Sunday to Sunday, so, you know, it's not um, uh, whatever day that was anyway, right? Uh, but I did send it to you, a second PowerPoint. I did also send another Pasipa done. We want to try to still look at that. This is almost two o'clock. Let's go straight into this. And folks, again, I'm not going to be reading every single thing. Right, I'm not going to be reading every single thing. I just want to kind of explain and move on a bit anyway. Um, you know, it's not quite primary school anyway, where we have to trace every single word, every single line, right? So it is kind of reading in um, Esperanza San Fernando here. Um, so what that does, it, it makes it harder for me to hear, right? Um, for, for what I know, though, like you all don't hear the reading, right? I have been on the other side of Zoom. So um, I think what happens is that you all don't hear what I'm hearing, but if it starts to fall really hard, it's going to be difficult for me to hear you. Um, so I'll, I'll let you know how that goes anyway. So um, we're on chapter two, if you have your books. Um, should I get to that? You'll see the almost the same heading, establishing uh, a process safety management system. And we kind of did this already, uh, process management or process risk. 2.1, outline the purpose and importance of establishing a process safety management system and its key elements. 2.2, uh, outline common risk management techniques used in the process industries. Now we'll probably get a little bit of that. Um, I just don't know how much we'll get of it, but next week would be some really detailed uh, process safety management analysis. One of them actually have some calculations in it, but um, you know, I don't think, I, I think a calculator is allowed should they decide to bring a calculation for you. Uh, but at the end of the day too, we all know risk, risk estimation, right? It still is, um, it still is simple calculation. Uh, it, it may not be because with some of the advanced RAs, um, it could involve decimal points, but still decimal points isn't too hard to multiply or add. Uh, once you remember how to do it, right? You just have to add the numbers and put back the point uh, where it was anyway. So we would not, we would not reach 2.4. We would definitely would reach 2.5, not 2.6 either. So establishing a process safety management system. So if anybody missed, I believe um, a couple of students missed um, something in chapter one. So here it is again, right? So it was in chapter one, but it's actually 2.1. If you have your books, you can go back and you can see um, you know, I think it was one point, was it 1.2, right? 1.2 was about process safety leadership. And that is like what this is about. Again, management systems is about leadership as well. So reason for developing an integrated and comprehensive process safety management system. Um, it allows for an organization or for the organization of the management of process safety risk in a systematic and chronological method of working that is driven by continual improvement. Uh, you can probably look at um, pages 25 or even 24 has the elements of a process safety management system, but we kind of did it already. So, you know, um, if you look at it, if you look at probably pages uh, 26, you'll see what I'm talking about, right? Those who know, like trying to think about what am I talking about? We're talking about this, right? The plan, do, check out cycle. We did it already, but they have it again here in 2.1. All right, so why develop a, a good management system? It, it, it demonstrates legal compliance with that, that acronym there stands for the Management of Health and Safety that were regulations 1999. It demonstrates senior management commitment to high priority policy aims and objectives. I'll kind of clear that up in a bit too because some of that is on the other page, page 27. It fosters an environment of positive safety culture. So it, it's almost like normal safety where the safety policy or the management system, like an ISO management system, will sort of improve the quality of the company. So it's the same thing, right? It's, it's almost the same idea of a normal safety management system. So all management systems in the world, if you probably turn the page, uh, this would be page um, 26. But you can still look at page 25 because they do really have a good management system there 
um, taken out of the old OSAS 18001, right? Uh, if you have your book, just take a note about the old OSAS 18001, uh, which would actually be ISO 45001 now, right? So 45001. But all management systems, they follow the idea of plan, do, check, and act, right? And you can see that in your book. And basically what they say, like when you're going to start to manage, we, we did this in, in 1.2, you start by coming up with your policy. So what's the policy of the company, right? So like, what is it aimed at to reduce accidents to zero? But in process safety, it would be like a more refined aim. It would be like to have zero... I try not to sum two, pro two processes, right? But I have to give a process example. Like, but I have like zero, um, tolerance then, right? For like a metal, then I have a certain element of corrosion in it, right? So again, in the offshore industry, that's like a good thing to aim for, right? So regular maintenance in the offshore industry so that there's zero corrosion on your processes then or whatever pipes is being used, right? But it would have to be something that is, it still is your policy, but it is your, but it is your policy now for process safety. I can give you a simpler one, right? So if it was a tank, the policy may have been to have regular inspection of valves and sensors and, you know, floating, you know, um, floating gauges or floats, right? Shut of valves. So that's your policy because you know, it still is what you want to do for process safety then, right? And of course, some of the regular things may work like um, having regular drills, uh, having, you know, fire, you know, drills and chemicals, spill drills, all of those things still kind of work as part of your plan, right? However, uh, so we did this already too, so I wouldn't bother do this. We did this in 1.2. Um, and for those of us who are new, because I think Rai and uh, Nika is new. You have to learn this chart, right? So we can use this opportunity here now to talk just a bit about the exam. The exam is not an open book exam, right? The exam is something you have to study for. So we did this in detail. If you have missed it, just go back and listen to, um, to the first recording. And the moral of that lesson was learn this chart, right? Because they can ask you, and look the question here, they ask here, but this is one question they ask here, where does implementation and operation fall, right? So implementation and operation, where does that align with? Like what part of the plan do check act cycle? So once you learn it, your new implementation and operation is do it. Again, different settings, different words, right? Like measuring performance falls under check-in, policy falls under planning, right? Let me admit another student, yeah. Right, and so folks learn it if you didn't know it, but we kind of moving on because that was, you know, 1.2. And, and so when we talk about our policy now though, right? Um, so once you have a management system, if you get uh, just on page 26 there, if you look at page 27, the same heading is their license to operate. Once you have a management system or you start planning for a management system. So this is the good news. Even if you're not quite certified, you could actually plan your management system to reflect ISO 45001 or still better yet in Trinidad and Tobago still. I don't think we have any Guyanese here. So I think um, I think still would work anyway, right? Um, so that's a good idea because eventually if you plan your management system really well, you could actually apply to the energy chamber. And if it wasn't still, you could apply to the ISO. You know, do, do those ISO providers, I think it have about two in Trinidad anyway two or three, right? And you can get a certificate. Of course you have to pay, right? To, to, to get the audit, you have to pay, but the benefit of um, getting your company two certified or getting your company ISO certified, Trinidad is most two, is that they can now access tenders then, right? They can, they can go to Yara, they can go to Atlantic, they can go to Proman as a contractor and they can say, you know, look, I mean, we want to find out when is your next, shut down, we want to provide a service to you. Whatever you all do, if it's providing pumps, rods, manpower, whatever have you, right? Uh, and so they will ask you the minimum. So are you still certified? So once you are, once you have a management system, right? And uh, folks, and like if you're still unclear what that means, it just means putting everything in a folder. I don't really have a folder on the desk, beside in the register. 
right? But it means putting everything in a folder. So you have your company's policy in a folder. And for store, they actually have, they actually have what they're looking for. They have every little bit of it, right? They have every little bit of it, what they're asking for. So if you could plan everything, folder them all. For those of us who know the store system is about 11 folders you'll end up with. Big, big folders. And I, like, I mean, not, not these anyway. I mean, like, like three prong folders you'll end up with anyway, because once you have your policies, you'll have to produce the evidence of it. And, and, and I guess in other words, like if, if you have uh, for doing, if you, if you have risk assessments, right? So you, you have like a template for risk assessment, but they'll want to see risk assessments done. They'll want to see the JDs of the workers. They want to see certificates. If you follow all of those things off, the benefit is that you can apply for store. And if it was ISO, even better, right? And you get a certificate and then you use that now, you know, to access those markets anyway, right? So the benefits of um, you know, a certificate is that you have a license to operate, right? And that simply means like you could, well, for some, for some companies you have to have a license to operate. Like for example, a school, like this school then, right? You have to have a license to operate. But I think for safety, um, the store is not really a license to operate, but it's a license to get access to tenders and, and then whatever monies you would have invested in your company on, right? Um, 20,000. 60,000 is kind of more like stew anyway, right? Uh, you know, you sort of make that back because when you do get access to one of these tenders anyway, you get back more than what you'd have invested anyway, right? So license to operate. Um, I think the thing they would have been to talk about stew, but I'm not going too much into it. Um, if anybody is not quite sure what stew is, you can research it as T-O-W and you can get the manual on the, on the Energy Chamber website. Uh, the, the, like the fun fact here is that if you are working in Trinidad, your company is going to have to be store certified, right? And uh, it might be, like I said, at first, but you should still stick to this standard because it is like the industry standard here. Around the world, it may be more ISO, but in Trinidad and Tobago, you know, it's more, if you have a policy, start fooling them off, right? And then you'll start putting it in place and, you know, you can get what is called your safety management system out of that. So just back to process safety, if you look at pages uh, 20, 27, on the right-hand side, you'd see there's actually a name given to the policy in process safety. So it's called a MAP policy. So I'll kind of break this down for you, right? We wouldn't read all, I'm just breaking it down for you. So MAP is a requirement of the law in the UK. There's a law called COMA. Remember, they don't ask too much of the laws. They don't ask too much of what year it was or whatever have you. But there's a law in the UK called COMA, it's, it's the Control of Major Accident Hazard Regulation 2015. You can find it on page, page 27. Is it in the same page of your book? I have been kind of assuming that we are using the same version of the book. Is it in the same page of your textbook? Just let me know. Because remember I said I do have, I think we established this last week that it was on the same page. But I didn't take up like the, the books we bought for you all then, right? Um, like your books came in out, you know, the most recent box anyway. But I have mine home here from, from like three years now. I'm sorry, no, that's actually six years now. Okay, so you all are saying it's in the same page, right? Remember we brought process safety here in 2017. Yeah, yeah, the years do go by fast, right? Faster for some anyway, right? But, uh, you know, like when we brought out telling you last week, um, no one in Trinidad had it. Right, uh, the course was never offered on the island then, right? Uh, but you know, I guess we used to say three years ago, that's almost six years now. All right, um, so the MAP, the Major Accident Prevention Policy um, is a requirement and um, the main thing in a MAP policy, right? Uh, so it's like a normal policy for those who kind of unsure, it's like a normal policy, but you have to make it for what it's seen uh, to prevent major accidents, you have to say, we at Yara or Proman, we are committed to preventing major accidents and taking care of the environment. In fact, there's the two main things of a MAP policy. Uh, I'll say it again. I think it's on the other slide, but I've seen it one time. It kind of is self-explanatory, right? Major accident prevention plan, right? So if they, if they give you four statements and they say which, which of the four is a major, you know, 
is a map policy, right? So it didn't have to be the one that addresses something serious. And remember, remember that's a nature of process safety, right? Um, I started to talk louder because you're really falling, but like I said, I, I think from what students tell me, you don't hear it on your side, right? So I try to keep the tone on one place anyway, as much as possible, right? So. Um, if you see something like that, saying that you're going to prevent major accidents and you are also going to protect the environment, that is a major accident prevention policy. So look at here, I did, I did it for you here. Right? So a map document is similar in approach to your normal health and safety policy document, but the two important additions. It must deal specifically with major accident hazards, as the heading suggests. And it must include measures to protect the environment. So I don't know if you want to um, take a note of that. Remember, you all are going in for multiple choice. It's not as if you have to write a map policy in real, but they can give you four and say, I guess which of the following, you know, fits within a map policy. Or in fact, they might even say they would map. They may just say a policy for a chemical company or chemical industry anyway, right? Folks, I don't want to spend too long on it because it have a lot, right? So now when I say a lot, I, I put a lot of stuff here. I put a lot of stuff on the PowerPoint for you all to read, but remember those who know me, I more work with the explanation so you all could read. So it have a lot of actual things here, like what could actually be in a map policy. So if you're in the process field and you don't know one, just read my slides and take them and write them over into your company's policy, right? So um, we talk about the law again, the policy must have a statement of intent, right? It must have uh, the aims and objectives for process safety management. And um, all of these here can be things that you want to commit to, right? So you could commit to things like um, saying that uh, the process technician, right, is responsible for maintenance, inspection on a daily basis of plant and equipment. So you can be very precise with what, um, what the policy requires. And I don't know if you know this though, right? But um, the policy have what I call aims and objectives. So you can be very specific with the objectives, right? Uh, when you write out a map policy. I don't think they'll be so precise, for example. I'm just really talking about real life now. Somebody really had to come up with a map policy or to write on one. You can be very specific. You can say, we are ProMan, we are committed to preventing major accident hazards. And then the objectives would be, this would be seen via um, performing hazard and operability studies, which is like a hazard. So you can be very specific then with what you want in your policy. But that level of uh, specifics, I don't think that is going to come for your exam, right? I think it's just a surface value question anyway, right? So tell me what you think there. Um, and if you're okay with that, that is actually finished. When you turn the page, if you turn the page, you'll see that, um, you know, that was what you needed to know. But hopefully, um, like I said, based on your company, you can take, if, if anybody was really doing this, and that's the thing, if anybody was really doing a map policy, but then you just say, we are, you know, Atlantic LNG are committed to preventing major accidents, you know, and then you can flesh it out and which is the aims and the objectives. But, that would be company specific, right? You can take some of the stuff I have here and you know try to fit things into it then. Like you can say that we are committed to regular audits, right? So you know you can base it on how often you want your audits. And if it's twice a week, um, twice for a quarter, so all of those things you can take it from here, like to, to do a drill regular drills every quarter. So you can take them from here and flesh them out, but I don't think that level of detail is gonna come for your exam, right? The next big thing here, right? Um, sort of quick at the same time, the next big thing here, I remember I told you all that level four, um, you know, relies on the level, the knowledge in level three, right? So you're seeing that over and over again. There is nothing more clear than like a normal policy and then there's a map policy. And here you have another two again. So are you all familiar with this term? Um, or are you all familiar with the term that you're looking at there? Um, on page 28, we're looking at um, leading and lagging indicators. Have you all heard about that already? Yeah, okay. So leading and lagging indicators is a term that is used through the companies 
Um, they may also say active and reactive. If you look at your book, page 28, you can't miss it. Right on the right hand side, you have what is a leading indicator. And then you have what is a lagging indicator. They have it in the sort of the green there with the key, right? So but then what's the difference? I mean, if that's, if that's how it is in normal safety, well then what's the difference? But well, the difference is this. Now remember folks, right? Remember, I don't have to do a little review of level three here, but I'm looking at the time. Um, so remember like leading indicators is anything that is positive. I just put a plus sign up there, right? Uh, lagging indicator is anything that is negative. And so like in, in level three, like a leading indicator then is like um, a leading indicator is like training. And of course these will still work, right? Training, but of course for process safety, the training would have to be something in process safety then, right? Like maybe um, we can pick something simple, like, you know, like uh, evacuation procedure in the event of a chemical spill or something. It could be more refined than that, right? Because the training for process safety it's more like um, if there is a spill then or a tank is overflowing, the training doesn't really wait for the tank to overflow. But the training is like how to deal with the overflow, right? So the process safety industry, they will have other manifolds, um, alternative valves then that they can open and close some of them remotely by pressing a button in the process control room and uh, valve would open and the overflow would just go to another chamber. If it is something maybe that was hot or exothermic, it can't just go to what is called a neutralization chamber or a blow down drum. So the training in process safety is not what we're talking about first aid and defensive driving. I think folks, I hope you're getting that. Because I'm trying you know, to relate to level three too for somebody who, did, who didn't do the level three. But in process safety, then remember, we can't wait. We can't wait for the spill. From the video that you saw, we can't really wait because if there was an explosion, a dust explosion, then that's the end of your plant, right? So the training, I don't know if you want to write this down, could you write it down? So the training for a leading indicator is training in like how to deal with an emergency, right? Or how to bring a system or a process that then back to normal operating conditions, right? Um, you know, a really good example was, um, I mean, we have so much of bad examples in Trinidad, but a really good one was Atlantic LNG some time ago had a process then that was out of its safe operated envelope, right? And it was on Facebook, right? Because um, how, how it was shown, it was shown where a worker, I don't know if he raised the alarm or whatever, but, but he was the one that was on the video, right? And he was just running, right? If you all know where Atlantic is at 0.410, Right, um, it's kind of like uh, lower down to the high street then, right? So literally it is down because it's, it's uh, you know, I mean, it's high street, but that doesn't mean it have to be high, right? But it is a street coming down and the high street is ready to the top, right? So the worker was seen running out of Atlantic, running on the main road and then running up back into high street, right? But the process operators didn't even flinch. They just did what they had to do, right? They engaged their uh, row solve, if, if, I mean, like, re, like re, remote shutter valves and, you know, they send the reactions into the blow down drums and the proper thing to say is like a neutralization chamber. And really and truly not even a smoke, not, not even, I mean, like an like a emission then was actually seen because they knew what to do. So folks, as I say, what, like when you see this for exam, but I'm going to talk about like leading indicators is like training in defensive driving is going to be something much more deeper than that, right? And what I said here too, just pay attention for this one, for the lagging indicator. If they give you an accident, great, but I don't think they would because by the time you have an accident, the lagging indicator, you, you know, like normal safety, you'll put here accidents, property damage. Remember those are the things that normally make up lagging indicators, right? Like, uh, okay, like two accidents in the month, you know, like um, 10 near misses, whatever, but you can't, you can't do that because, well, if you're, if you're doing that, you're probably not alive anymore in a plant, right? If the plant may have gone up in smoke. So for, for the lagging indicators, what I wanted to take a note of, and I have a lot on this slide, I just do the explanation. 
after class in the week when you all get time, you all go home and read them. I'll show you some in the book too. But if you understand and you understand that if anything is positive, the plus sign, it's a leading indicator. And it, it might be something a little bit more refined than you know, what we have been saying about defensive driving. It may be like what I said. And then the lagging indicators, anything that is negative, but you wouldn't see an apparent accident then or fire because by that time it's too late, right? So the lagging indicators is a little bit more specific, right? So lagging here, if you can take a note, is just something then that is not where it's supposed to be or not how it's supposed to be, right? So you can't wait. So the, the adequate process, if you can't wait for a fire, because other than that, you know, you would be, you'd be out of here then, right? So, you know, you can't wait for a fire. So what you're looking at, so I wanna read some for you, but I'm just trying to give you some examples before I go. Like, they would probably say like, they did a test for corrosion and they got more corrosion than they should have gotten then, right? So something outside of a limit. Um, anything that sounds like it's a bit off then, you know, like a pressure gauge, uh, and they may give it a pressure, something PSI, but then when they actually check, it was like beyond that then. So then that's your lagging indicator. This is why we have shutdowns, by the way. This is why we have shutdowns to so change all those parts, right? That may be coming to the end of their life and stuff like that for maintenance or replacement, right? So the lagging indicators will take a note that you don't look for the apparent damage or property because at the process level, remember process safety, these are stuff that is low occurrence but high severity. So you can't wait for that. Do we have any questions on this? As you're thinking about it, I wanted to turn your page and they do have some. In fact, they have a good bit and I have a good bit too, but Let's just use the one in the book, right? And uh, when, like, in the week, if you have the notes, you can read it out. I have a lot as well. I try to put as much as I could put, but chances are they're not going to use mine. They, they're probably going to use the one from the book, right? Or they're just going to make up one, right? So if it sounds a bit off, it's a lagging indicator. Like for example, then like, um, so like a lagging indi indicator could actually be like they did a check, they did an audit of the, competence and it was found that a process operator has not done training for the last three years. So that is actually a lagging indicator, right? And of course, some of the more proud ones, you know, is like the things with equipment and stuff. Just take a look at um, page 29. And there's a catch here, but let me, let me do the thing first and then I'll tell you the catch, All right? So I read it from the book, I read about three, in each, well, it only have four. So look at my slide, I guess, but the thing is what I'm telling you, you don't really need any slide or any book. You just need to know that leading is positive and lagging is negative, but with the negative ones, you have to be a bit careful because you mightn't see the apparent old way it was in level three then, right? It mightn't be, you know, property damage and stuff. It may be something a bit more refined. So from page 29, if you have it, let me know. I'll just read out the first three for you. So potential lagging indicators. And remember, there's a little trick somewhere here, right? But we had to read it first before I tell you the trick. Well, not my trick. This is Nibosh way of trying to trick students, right? But, you know, all we can do is tell you what they did. So um, potential lagging indicators. I have the number of une unexpected loss of containment incidents due to failure of flexi hose. I think they've been very specific here. Um, coupling pumps, valves, flanges, fixed pipes, bulk tanks, or instrumentation, right? So the number of unexpected loss of containment. So that, so that could never be positive, right? So if that was to come, I mean, that could never be positive, right? The number of loss of containment, so again, that kind of sums it up. The number of fires or explosion that results from a state, sorry, from static electric ignition. That that's again, there's no way to think that's even leading. This is all lagging, right? Uh, the number of incidents, fire explosions. So I didn't quite like the ones in the book because it kind of deviated from what I had. You can read my slides, you'd see, like I said, things like a slight deviation, right? From a process 
parameter then could be a logging indicator if you want to get right down one or two i mentioned they wanted corrosion already but a really simple one could be like a process was meant to be at 21 degrees celsius right a process was meant to be at 21 degrees celsius but it is at 23 degrees celsius or it's at 19 degrees celsius right um, now nothing has happened there is no fire there is no spill but do you understand that that is a lagging indicator as well right once it is outside of a parameter then it is a lagging indicator tell me if you understand that one right because it's not where it's supposed to be it is a lagging indicator right let's read about three from the book of uh, um, leading indicators so percentage of safety critical plant equipment that performs within specification when inspected so that just sounds positive doesn't it right it performs within specification so then that's a leading indicator percentage of safety critical plant and equipment inspection again inspections are always positive right um so once they say completed to schedule it's going to be positive it, that the statement sounds positive right so it is going to be a leading indicator percentage of fault trending carried out to schedule right so again that may be things like the um well, there's a calculation for that. So I, I even forget to mention the word, but what the word should I say? There's actually a type of calculation for that called fault. You could write it down if you want to understand that a bit better, but we wouldn't reach it today, right? But it's called a fault tree analysis, FTA for short, a fault tree analysis, right? So there's actually a calculation for that. Now, if you look, I want you to look at page 29 and make an observation for me, and I'll try to tell you what the trick is. Um, but let's try to see if you can make the observation first, right? Um, just, just guess it. Don't, I mean, there's nothing wrong or right here. It's just a guess that you're trying to make, right? Um, look at the lagging indicators and look at the leading indicators. There's a little trend in them. Anybody can tell me what is that trend? And then I'll tell you what's the trick. Just make a guess. Like when you start reading lagging indicators, and when you look at leading indicators, there's something common in them. There's something common, and then there's something different between each of them. What is common, and I guess what is different? And this, you should underline with a pencil or whatever, because this, you know, is the trick. But we need to see it first. In the lagging indicators, they're looking at a number. Very good. The leading indicator looking at a percentage. Very good, right? So that's the observation, right? So thanks very much, Dea Vajanti. So that's it. That's it, right? So Kavita as well had it, right? So the lagging indicators looks at numbers and the leading indicators look at percentage. Now that is typically so. So you have to put that in your head. You have to learn that then. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Remember, it's multiple choice, right? Um, so like they would say, which of the following is a leading indicator, right? Um, so they will have like percent. I, I just using the book for the first one, right? I use it, I use it back page 29. So they will say, which of the following is a leading indicator? And they have percentage of safety critical plant equipment that performs within specification when inspected. But then guess what they do? They have number of safety critical plant equipment that performs within specification when inspected. They switch the word with you then. So one, remember it's multiple choice, right? So one of them have percentage, the other one have number, right? One have percentage, one have number, and you don't have your book to open to remember what Vijanti just said. So you need to write it down. Right? And there's actually another trick again. So let's see how fast you can get the tricks and them written down. And we can finish off this. Happy quarter past, uh, it's 18 minutes past two already. So what I'll do after this, I think I'll just go into, I wanna kind of run through some questions from the people. 
So remember, folks, I am not Nibosh. I am not here to trick you, but they are here to trick you, right? So we try it as we do some theory. We try to, you know, um, say what they're doing then so that you don't get caught, right? So the most obvious thing, lagging indicators start up with number of, leading indicators start up with percentage of, right? But the last trick is this, right? The last trick is this. What if, because they did that on a passive not all, uh, they just stick to the book sometimes, or stick to the pattern. What if for the leading indicator, I don't know if you understand this, what if for the leading indicator, for the four answers, I use in leading, right? I'm gonna use leading as the example. I wouldn't do lagging, because you know it's the same thing vice versa anyway. So what if they say, which of the following is a leading indicator? Say so you have your A, you have your B, you have your C, you have your D, right? And remember, listen to this, how or what they did, right? Remember, they didn't have to be positive. So what I saw in a passive is that they were, of course, four statements, right? And the only statement that was correct then, the only statement that was correct. So like for leading, check on, I don't know if you're trying to tell, like for leading, they said percentage of. So each of these had percentage of. I think Nibosh has smoke or drink or something, right? So, you know, but it is a trick and as a native multiple try. So the lead in had percentage off, right? So, so all of them have percentage off, but what's the trick, right? When you read the statements on them, they were all negative. So what they're trying to do? When you read the statements that it was like percentage of containment loss. But that can't be positive because there's a loss. Percentage of fire explosion then. Then, so, it, it, so the word percentage was correct, but the statement itself was wrong because to be a leading indicator, you must be what? You must be positive. And guess what? The only correct answer it had that was positive had number off. The only one it had that was actually positive had number off. So, you know, this is just, you know, I guess via, I guess, you know, just different to the rules then of, of, of what we just saw. But I think the overall thing though is that leading must be positive. And uh, you have to really read these statements and don't just go for the only one that is percentage, right? So overall, they must be positive. A leading indicator is something that is good. And the only good one here had number of something that was completed, right? It is multiple choice. It is what it is. Not every question is out there to trick you, but it is what it is, as they say, right? Folks, let's um try to look at, uh, I had sent, um, oh, somebody on the outside. Um, right, I did send two passivas for you all already. Um, there's one student, well, three students, but one of them here would have done all already, right? Uh, trying to see if we could admit Adrian at the same time. So you can check to see if you get this passive, but again, up, if it was up to me, I would send you another one this week, because for me, remember we said the more you all do, the more questions you will get to repeat, right? Now, some of them, they don't have all 40 questions. I think I explained that last week to you all. These are, um, you know, I mean, how, how to say that? These are like, you know, rip off questions then, right? I mean, Nibosh doesn't really give us a question paper, but these are questions that we kind of get from students when they come out of the exam room, which is how it was before the pandemic, right? And, um, even with the, with the exam, the way it is now, they're still repeating the majority of the same questions, right? Folks, the thing giving some trouble here, right? They probably see the, the screen freeze a bit. Um, I, I don't know if you can tell me if you are seeing uh, the past paper, though. I'm trying to get um, it to go down a bit. It should be saying process safety management level four sample questions from March 2018. Are you all seeing that on your screen? Okay. Yes. Or no? Yes. Okay, um, I, I can't remember if we did any those. So can you remember if we did any? I, I know we kind of looked at some randomly last week. 
Um, okay, so thanks to Ronnie. Ronnie Ronnie said yes. All right, so here what, number one, based on your time, right? Number one, A. Number one, A. Number two, now, I mean, we shouldn't do it like this. Eh? Just that everything seems to be pausing at the moment here. So if you can hear me still, number one, A. Number two, I don't think we did this. Which of the following is likely to be most helpful in developing a positive health and safety culture? I really don't have time to ask everybody to give their views. Uh, which of the following is likely to be most helpful in developing a positive health and safety culture? Um, what am I doing? I actually have the answers for this, right? Instead of trying to figure it out again. Um, Number two, anyone have the answer for that? Before I um, stress myself. So the answer is actually C, promotion of process safety leadership at board level visible, um, sorry, board level visibility of site visits, right? Uh, number three, folks are, are trying to do as much as I could because the clock is, you know, ticking away. Process safety involves a commitment to continuous improvement the answer is B, run it down as much as possible. What is the main reason for sharing lessons learned? I think we did that one. The answer was B for that one. The potential benefits are much greater for the process safety industry as a whole. So that's a better answer, right? Um, number five, I believe we did this one too. The key elements of a process safety management follows the plan, do, check, act, model, management, review. See if we get if we didn't do that one, I don't think we did that one. Management review is what part of the model. You can, I guess you can say it verbally, folks, because at the time we have, you don't have to put it in the chat because I, I don't want to keep going up there and clicking off that box and clicking off the box and putting back here. Just see if you can tell me what management review. Management review falls within what, what element? Hmm. Again, anybody else? I didn't quite hear you. You can unmute your mics and let us have a quick thing with it. Anytime now would be good to tell us what the answer is. You're less saying C, management review, management review. Anybody else? You're putting it in the chat, but it's doing as long to get it in the chat. Okay, the answer is D, right? The answer is D. So thanks very much for the correct answer, right? Um, so you see why you have to learn the chart, right? Remember, it's not an open book test. Uh, now we can open the book and look and see, look at D, open the PowerPoint, but it's not, right? Um, it's not an open book test then, right? Which of the following is a leading indicator? Audit results, manufacturing defects. So it must, it must sound overall positive, right? So B is wrong. Okay, here yeah, what well, the answer is E. The everything is there is negative. Everything there is negative again, right? Correct answer again, right? Well, you all have the correct answers. My cursor, every time I go up there, the cursor is kind of rotating, which is why you see me trying to maneuver and being stuck on the screen at the same time, right? Because, um, all right, uh, number seven. Which form of risk assessment is most appropriate when the, when the risk is potentially intolerable? Now, we haven't done this yet. This is actually the next thing we were going to do. But if the risk is intolerable, what you need is a risk assessment that is not subjective. And uh, the risk assessment that is not subjective, let me see what you'll have. Um, if anybody wanna just shout it or make a guess, right? Qualitative is subjective. Qualitative is like saying hi. But how high is high? Well, I guess for some people, high can be very high, right? Um, so I've seen a lot of the correct answers there. Thanks again for those who put all the answers, but the correct answer is there too. Um, the answer is D, quantitative. Quantitative is like using calculations and quantitative means numbers. So like if you use a number, a number is more specific than a word then. And I know you all know the laboratory version of that, but you all didn't see nothing yet. They're really not talking about 25 here. 
Next, we're going to talk about that. I'll just say that they're not talking about 25. Five by five, 25, they're not talking about that. When we say precise, we mean precise. Precise down to a decimal point, like 0 0.8667. That's a quantitative risk assessment, and that's called an ETA, an inventory analysis. We even came across the other one, which is the FTA. The fall tree analysis is also quantitative like that. Right, number eight, a permit to work is usually required in preparation for a activity with high risk, high risk, right? Nine, which of the following is most likely to help you develop a safe system of work? Well, another way or another, some companies, you know, don't say um, safe system of work. They say um, a TBRA, a task-based risk assessment. Somebody was talking to recently about this, right? You know, like um, in a company, they were saying, the person told me they wasn't saying JSA, they were saying TBRA, task-based risk analysis. If you see task, task analysis, a task analysis is like a JSA. And a JSA is a safe system of work, right? So again, thanks for the answers there, those who put those in, right? I try to reach 15. I try to reach 15 in one minute time, right? So inspecting a workplace where contract workers are carrying out work is performance monitoring, actively monitoring, condition monitoring, reactively monitoring. Now, if you are doing an inspection, it's called active monitoring. So the answer is B, right? Number 11, maintenance work is planned at plant A, like paria. The work is highly, sorry, likely to have a significant impact on the operation of a second plant, plan B. What is the most effective way of controlling risk between the two points in this situation? And this is also Piper Alpha, the answer is A, you have to put a duplicate of your permit. Sorry, my mistake. You have to put, um, no, yeah, duplicate permit, which is D, sorry, right? I watch it, then I watch it here. So display a duplicate permit to work in plant A and plant B, right? So the answer is D. And again, things like that could have saved a life. A lot of correct answers here, right? Um, with paria and the cursor is rotating, right? So I'll try to get to 15, number 12. And you'll mark it off, right? For those who haven't done it yet, we would have reached 12. I'll take um, four minutes at a time again, right? What is normally included in a periodic review of the safety performance of contractors working on site? So if it's a periodic review, you want to... Um, a is, saying, a is saying, sorry, you want to look at their risk assessment on official licenses. Now, you wouldn't look at licenses if it's a contractor on your site already. You understand? You'd have looked at the license if they were now coming to you, so A is wrong. Scrutiny of contractor health and safety policy? No, you're doing that when you're now going to hire them. Anybody have an answer? Let's have one answer on the chat so far. Analysis of contractor trading records, no, all of that you're doing before you hire them, right? Right, folks, you understand that? Like you wouldn't be looking at a qualification when they're working already. They said periodic review of contractors working on site. So these, these people already working for you already. So the answer would have to be, I guess if I get or D, inspection to check compliance and accident data review meetings and stuff like, because I give they attending the meetings, are they coming to your meetings? Are they taking part in GSAs? But they're working for you already. And again, these are things folks I have done. Some of you all have done it too. You know, um, there are some companies that, uh, some companies, I don't know if you all know some companies, if they fail the compliance order, then they could send you home, right? Like a compliance check, if you fail the compliance, you know what, they send the contractor home. Some companies not like that because the contractors would be everybody friend, so they wouldn't want to send them home, right? Safe operating envelope involves adhering to, uh, the answer is A, 13 is A, upper and lower operating limits. This is actually chapter three, but it's an envelope, right? An envelope talks like about a range. Another way of thinking of this is like a range. So like making, uh, a product, even something like the drink, a soft drink, a beer, right? Wines, whatever have you. Like the manufacturers, then like they will have a certain percentage. And as I was talking about the temperature, like the temperature must be kept for a certain 
you know, and once that temperature va like varies then out of the safe operating envelope, whatever is being made, you could think of, like I said, soft drink or beer, whatever, right? Uh, if it's like sugar, um, you know, water, of course, all of the chemicals they put in it, right? You know, um, but like once they, once you put too much of something there, then you're out of the safe operating envelope. And then, you know, you would have crossed then perhaps the upper or the lower and you can't even cross the lower, right? I don't know if you know that too. Like if a process was meant to be at 21, you cannot keep it at 19 because you'll spoil your reactants. Think about, like I said, something that someone is making to eat or drink. It have to be within a particular limit then that's called the safe operating envelope, right? All right, two more to go, two more to go and we're done, right? Um, okay, so correct answers there again. All right, so you see what I was saying, you don't really need, uh, you just need a bit of guidance and you need your past papers, so you need to be, you know, um, in them, you know, to get the final exam okay, right? So a processor shut down automatically due to an unexpected and sudden pressure increase. So it was outside of the standard operating condition this best describes, and you learn this too, uh, there are many types of shutdown. For example, the shutdown that's going on now is what is called a plan shutdown. Everybody plan it. They plan who have to come, they plan the contractors, they plan how much people they need, right? It's called a plan shutdown. But you have other types of shutdown, stage, delay, and emergency. In fact, if you read this one though, right, with care, it's something that is a bit, you know, hazardous. There have been an unexpected and they have been, you know, pressure increase, something is outside of the operating condition. So, you know, this is not planned. They did say unexpected. It's not stage even, it's not delayed even. I'll tell you what delayed is next week. But delayed is simple, I can tell you now when a de delay is like, you notice a small leak or you notice something simple like a valve. Um, maybe the valve have a play with it, the valve head or something, have a play. Right? Well, a valve is meant to close and you know open. So maybe when you close it, you realize it's not fully closed. And when it's open, it's not fully open. It's a bit of a play with it, but it's not a major valve, right? It's like a runner valve and it's like a secondary runner valve. So like there was another valve before that and the other valve before that is working good. But this secondary runner valve or drain valve have a bit of a play, but you have a shutdown coming up in the next week. So when you stop all operations today, or probably tag that valve, you know, lock off and tag it off or whatever, uh, you know, and say it's not working in order and wait for next week. That's called a delayed shutdown, right? So let's have a note of that as a simple example. Now they like to bring these folks, you're seeing it here. I mean, you're seeing it here. This time it's tested emergency, but what if they change it up and they, they say, in fact, the most common one, for those of us, if you print your paper, the most common one is actually delayed. That's, that's, so that's why I explained that one. The most common one is exactly what I just tell you, right? They notice a leak and they decided to leave it for a planned shutdown, which is about like maybe a couple of days away. What type of shutdown is that, right? Number 15 and the last one, temperature, sorry, pH. I'm reading the wrong thing. You see, that's my, that's my chemistry there, right? Um, so pressure, temperature, flow, level, pH, and density are all common process, processes associated with safe operating envelopes, problems associated with safe operating envelopes, parameters associated with safe operating envelopes, procedures associated with safe operating envelope. And the best answer here is C. This again is something in chapter three. Um, all those things with safe operating envelope and stuff, but you have your books as far as I'm aware. If I'm, I'm aware everyone have their book, you can just open your book and research as you do the questions, right? Um, actually, too, you'll have to come across the word parameter next week because next week we're doing a hazard and they do use the word parameter to describe all of these. Flow is a parameter, pH is a parameter, density, pressure, temperature, etc. right? Tell me what you think. So thanks for all the answers there, whether or not they were correct or not, right? Uh, thanks for putting the answers. And uh, I'm, I'm seeing that one had a lot of correct answers anyway, right? That one had quite a lot of correct answers. So folks, that's a wrap for today. I did take about a couple minutes extra because of the past year. But anyway, we have to do it. 
we have to do it. And I think that was because of the video. You all know I do like to show those things, but you know, 